Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 19th of September of 2020. The article that I'm going to be discussing today was published in Chest and is titled Leadership Essentials for the Chest Physician, Emotional Intelligence. It was written by James Stoller, who is the professor and chairman of the Education Institute at Cleveland Clinic. The reason why I want to speak about this article today is because I've always been somebody who has been intrigued by emotional intelligence. To those of you who do not know what emotional intelligence is, it is defined as the capacity to understand your own and others' emotions and to motivate and develop yourself and others in service of improved work performance and enhanced organizational effectiveness. The reason why this is important in healthcare is because it relates to ultimately having enhanced patient satisfaction amongst clinicians and folks in healthcare. There's lower burnout. There's lower litigation risk, and in addition to this, there's enhanced leadership success for those of us who want to go into leadership one day. Unfortunately, this article is hidden behind the paywall, so you can't download it for yourself unless you have a subscription to Chess, or if you decide to go ahead and email the author of this paper, which I recommend you do because it's a good paper. In the discussion, he talks about the general rubrics of emotional intelligence, which are four of them, honestly, and it's self-awareness self-management, social awareness, as well as relationship management. The reason why this is important for us to know is that a lot of this is intrinsic to the person, but much of it could be learned and taught. And in critical care, I think it's of utmost importance for this to be learned as well as taught to our trainees. Truth is, you could be the smartest clinician in the world, but unless you have emotional intelligence, patients and their families are really not going to notice that and you're not going to come off as a likable person. The author even goes as far as to say that emotional intelligence is more important in a person's success than the IQ. Some of the original people who did the research and all this divided it up into four major components, which include the ability to perceive emotions in oneself and others accurately, the ability to use emotions to facilitate thinking, the ability to understand emotions, emotional language, and the signals conveyed by emotions, and last but not least, the ability to manage emotions in order to obtain specific goals. So as I mentioned before, this could be broken into self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, as well as relationship management. Let's dissect all this in a manner that's applicable for what we do in critical care. First of all, talking about self-awareness, where the first thing we need to focus on is our own emotional self-awareness, where we read our own emotions and recognize how our emotions make other people feel and how we could translate this over to families. An example of that is, for example, if we're in a code situation and you are not able to control your own emotions and you're being very angry and not constructive with your team. You know, people are fat, uh, people make mistakes and there are gonna be some times where things don't go as well as they should go during a code. Anybody who has participated in a code in real life knows this, but, If your reaction as a clinician is to go ahead and lash out at people, it's not, it's not going to go well. It's not going to make your team function any better. They're actually going to function worse. Another thing of self-awareness is to have an accurate self-assessment of your own strengths and limitations. For example, if you try to go in over your head and take care of a patient and not ask a, excuse me, and not ask a consultant for some advice, this could actually put harm into that patient. It could actually make them worse. It could, it could actually worsen patient outcomes. So you have to know your strengths as well as your limitations. When are the opportunities that you can go ahead and take charge of a patient and take 100% ownership? Or when are you going over your head and reaching too far? And I'm going to give you a very transparent uh, example of this. My training is in pure critical care. I do not have the bronchoscopy capabilities that a lot of my partners who have who are pulmonologists and they do you know uh, navigational bronchoscopy and e-buses and biopsies all those things they just happen to be better than me at this and that's perfectly fine so whenever i have a case where somebody has a very complicated bronchoscopy that needs to be done i'd rather call for help than try to do it myself and then last with regards again to self-awareness you have to have some sort of self-confidence When you're taking care of the critically ill patients, you are the last line between the patient being alive and the patient having a poor outcome. So you have to 
be confident in yourself to know what your self worth is, what your capabilities are, and that's why you train and you study. You study so hard. I mean, that's why you listen to this podcast because you are trying to do better, and this helps out your emotional intelligence because it makes you more self confident in your capabilities of taking care of patients. To add to that last component of self confidence, we all know the clinicians who just can't make a decision for the life of them. We hear the nurses talk smack about them, make commentary because they go ahead, they make one decision, five minutes later, they change it to another, then they change it to another. They don't just make a decision and stick with it. You need to develop your own training and your own your own knowledge base so that you do not become this person who keeps on flip-flopping and doubting their own capacity and their own capability. It's okay for you to think, you know, could I do this, that, the other, because obviously there are different ways to manage certain things but at the end of the day you have to make a decision because flip-flopping every every 45 seconds or so is is not something that's helpful for your team then we have to look at the self-management component of all this starting off with emotional self-control again this goes back to to you keeping your disruptive emotions and impulses in check don't become that person who's screaming at other people yelling cussing this is not productive in any way shape or form to how the team works if there's something that goes poorly during a code that's why you debrief at the end to speak about it and to kind of clear the air you you want to try to do better every single time things aren't going to work perfectly every single time but unless you have that emotional self-control i mean (laughs) you you hear about it all the time the doctors who and clinicians or nurses who have just bad attitudes, they throw charts, they hit the screen on the computer, they just don't have themselves under control. That's that's something that people need to get better at. Then there's also the component of transparency, where you always have to be as honest as you can. You have to develop trust amongst your team, as well as the patients and their families. You have to be transparent with them with everything. I mean, feel free to say that you don't know, because at the end of the day, we don't know everything. That's why every single day there's so much so much data being published because we're trying to answer questions we don't know. And if you go ahead and you try to make up an answer and you know it ends up being a huge lie, you're going to lose the trust of that patient and the family, as well as your team for that matter. You also have to be adaptable, which means that you have to have flexibility in adapting to changing situations or overcoming obstacles. Not every single day is the same. Um, And I've done a podcast before as well as uh, a YouTube video on what my day in the ICU is like. But I have to be ready to hit the ground running at 8 o'clock and start taking admissions. Or, you know, uh, they will come during rounds or after rounds. You have to be able to adjust your day based on what's, what's happening around you. If there's a crashing patient, if there's a new consult, if there's somebody who needs a hand in the emergency department, you need to be adaptable and, and help out your team to try to have the best outcomes. There are people who, if they get off of their regular ebb and flow, they get all cranky, they get snippy, they get feisty with their staff, and that's just unacceptable. So you have to stay adaptable as well. In addition to that, you have to have this inner inner sense of wanting to achieve something. You have to have a drive in order to improve your performance, to try to be the best clinician, best nurse, best respiratory therapist, best pharmacist, the best you possibly could be. And that's why I commend those of you who are joining me as I'm currently trying to get better myself and trying to achieve the most you can. In addition, you also have to have a lot of initiative, which they define as a readiness to act and seize opportunities. If a patient needs to be taken care of, stop trying to punt it over to the next clinician, to somebody else, for somebody else to do the job. Just go ahead and do it yourself and be done with it seize that opportunity, take care of that patient. It's going to make you feel a lot better to just take care of it than to punt it over and leave it for somebody else to do. Then you also have to be optimistic. I mean, this is going to, this is what helps out with burnout a lot. You know, even during this COVID crisis, which has been so horrific for a lot of us who are the boots on the ground, you know, as seeing how the numbers have been decreasing of the people coming into the ICUs and all that, we have to see an upside to that. Yes, we have lost a lot of people, but we need to continue taking care of those who need us. And we need to be the best we possibly can be. We need to be optimistic about the future, about COVID, about everything. Moving on to talking about social awareness, where they have three competencies here, which include empathy, organizational awareness, and service orientation. And with regards to empathy, you have to be able to sense the emotions of other people. 
you know, obviously nobody's going to be happy being in the intensive care unit, where you, whether you're a patient or a family member. You can't be making jokes around these people and their families. I mean, that's something that bothers me quite often when I'm trying to have a uh, difficult conversation with somebody and outside I just hear people giggling or making commentary about something else in the hallway or the nurse's station. It's it's tough for that person. I, I understand that we are jaded by what we see every day, uh, being surrounded by people who are not doing very well, people who are very sick. But sometimes we got to keep our emotions in check, sense the emotions of other people, and try to replicate what they're going through within ourselves. We have to understand their perspective, and we have to take interest in what their concerns are, because a lot of times this could help us figure out what the goals of care of the patients are going to be. You know, like if you find out by a conversation with the patient's loved ones that they've been suffering for many months and they're in septic shock on four pressors, then that could be a way to open up the door for a conversation of goals of care as to how aggressive they want to be. Next up, let's talk about organizational awareness. And what this has to do with is the reason why I think it's important that they put in this article because there are a lot of people who like to go into work, they check in, they clock in, excuse me, they do their work and they clock out. And then they just want to complain about everything that's going on in the organization that they disagree with. But there are many opportunities in every institution to work your way up in the administrative level. There's many positions in leadership where one could try to actually improve outcomes and make things better as opposed to just venting about it. Because if you start diving into what's going on from the organization level and what the politics are within every dimension of the hospital, you start learning as to why certain decisions were being made. And a lot of decisions are stupid. And once you work your way up, if you notice the decision is stupid, you can actually say it's stupid and come up with a better idea as to how to fix it. It'll be better for your emotions, for your happiness and all that. If you see something wrong, you get involved in a way to change it as opposed to just complaining about it. So to close off this whole podcast, we'll talk about the last competencies with regards to relationship management. The first one being inspirational leadership, where one guides and motivates our, our team. And this is always important to try to improve outcomes with our patients as well as keep everybody happy. You want to guide people to be better, teach them why you do certain things, why you manage patients a certain way, teach your nursing students why things help patients get better. This, this helps out a lot in, in your own satisfaction with your job. In addition to that, you want to improve your influence. How are the ways that you're going to improve your communication with the nursing staff, RTs, colleagues, etc., so that things could get done in a better way? You want to go ahead and develop other people, make them better. That's part of the reason why I do all these ventures on social media and whatnot. That takes a lot of time. I want to go ahead and bolster the ability of other people, guide you all, via evidence as to how you can better take care of patients and make an impact in that way. You know, it's a catalyst for change where we go ahead and we initiate uh, different therapies by by showing you different studies. We alter how we manage patients and hopefully we could figure out a way to go in a better direction. You know, like, for example, with all this COVID stuff that we've been that we've been talking about on my pages and whatnot, that could change the way patients are being managed at different institutions. It's it's a great feeling. I mean, it's it's something great that we could go ahead and publish something, put something on social media, and then it gets spread out like wildfire throughout all different hospitals across the United States, for example. Then we also have to be good and be smart about conflict management and how to resolve disagreements. You know, if somebody's not up to par, how are we going to discuss? Uh, how are we going to discuss resolving these issues? when ultimately in critical care there are a lot of egos because ultimately it's going to be very helpful to build these bonds with our colleagues and our staff where we have this web of relationships where could eventually socialize one day or be able to exchange ideas or be completely open and transparent with each other as to how we could be better and ultimately this leads to better teamwork and collaboration where we just get the job done in a flawless manner and it it closes the door to a lot of errors occurring when, when we get all these things working with a nice ebb and flow. Hopefully you all enjoyed this podcast. I know when I was reading this article, again, titled Leadership Essentials for the Chess Physician, Emotional Intelligence by Dr. James Stoller, I really learned a lot and gave me a lot of time to have some inflection as to 
things that I could do better with regards to my own emotional intelligence so I could be the best physician possible and the best human being possible. Thank you all for your support and my podcast and everything else I do. Have a great day. Bye.